Today is Numbers Day, and welcome to this Workers by the Numbers blogcast presented by the Power at Work blog. I'm Alicia Modestino, a professor at Northeastern University and the executive director of Community to Community, a new initiative to promote the use of community-engaged research to make social change. This morning, we're going to talk about the latest job numbers, unemployment, wages, which is hot off the presses from the Bureau of Labor Statistics just 15 minutes ago. Joining me in analyzing the numbers is our expert panel with a lot of experience analyzing all sorts of labor market issues and advising policymakers and practitioners about the labor market. First, we have Dr. Aaron Sojourner, who is a senior researcher at the W.E. Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Good morning, Aaron. Morning. And second, we have Dr. Harry Holzer, who is the John Lafarge Jr. Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy and former chief economist for the U.S. Department of Labor. Good morning, Harry. Morning, Alicia. Thank you both for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. All right, let's do the numbers, um, as Kai Rizdahl likes to say. Uh, Here are the headline numbers from BLS's uh, September Employment Situation Report. The unemployment rate held steady at 3.8% in September. Although this is the highest unemployment rate since February 2022, when the Fed first started raising rates, it's still pretty low by historical standards. Plus, we just saw weekly jobless claims have been trending lower for the past um, few weeks, possibly indicating a reluctance on the part of employers to cut payrolls. The economy created a whopping 336,000 jobs in September. We were all surprised by this number. So were all the other economists. Uh, who were surveyed uh, by the Wall Street Journal who were expecting an increase of 170,000 jobs. We all missed this one. Um, That's also an increase from August and July's numbers, uh, which were about 230,000 jobs created in each of those months. That's a revision upward, which is a pretty considerable revision. It's also in line with what we would expect to see uh, in a healthy but cooling jobs market coming off a crazy fast average increase of 400,000 jobs per month in 2022. So far in 2023, we're seeing um, average growth of about 250 to 300,000 jobs per month. Um, And so again, this is kind of at least in line with that, but surprising by what we were expecting for today. And then my final headline number here is average hourly earnings increased by seven cents uh, from August to September for an annual growth rate of 4.2% over the past 12 months. Last month, we saw wages rise at about the same pace Um, for a similar annual increase of 4.3%. And we'll find out a little bit more probably what that means um, comparing to inflation, because we know it's not just the headline number of where wages go, but what you get to buy with it. All right, so let's turn to our experts. And I'm going to turn right to Harry at first to kind of rip off of maybe those wage numbers. Uh, Are these numbers good for workers, bad for workers? Are they a mixed bag? Um, I I think they're very mixed. you, you have this contrast between uh, the payroll growth, the 336,000, and, and Alicia, as, as you emphasize, the upward revisions of the past two months. Uh, together, that averages out to 266,000 uh, over the last three months. That's a lot bigger than we thought it was. As you said, the, those, those revisions for the previous two months were really large. So that number, if you look only at that, that's, that suggests that there's still a lot of steam in the labor market uh, and, and that things are still uh, growing pretty fast. On the other hand, those wage numbers are very moderate. Uh, you know, the seven cents an hour that you mentioned, that number alone on an annual basis is just 2.5%, really just keep sort of keeping up with inflation. Uh, over the past two months, it's sort of like 2.7%. So you have this contrast between the job creation seems very strong, but the wage growth seems more moderate. Um, when I look at the individual sectors behind the payroll growth, what I notice is that it's it's a little bit the 336, the big jump is a little misleading because nearly two thirds of that growth was just in three sectors, mm. uh, leisure hospitality, uh, government, and healthcare. You look at many other sectors, the, the growth is much more moderate. You look at the sectors that might be sensitive to interest rates. Uh, manufacturing was, I think, uh, 17, construction 11. So in many sectors, the growth is much more moderate. Wage growth is moderate. And yet the eye-popping headline 
might a little bit overstate what's going on. There's just a lot more unevenness across these sectors. So when I look at these numbers, I, I would hope the Fed would not slam on the brakes, uh, but but we don't know which they're going to put the most weight on. So you know, I, I would say it's still pretty good for workers, um, but but I do fear it will fear it will lead the, the Fed to to hit the brakes harder on interest rates. I think you had a really great point there about how, how uneven it is. Um, and that makes it a really tricky situation for the Fed, right? Um, I really wouldn't want to be in their shoes right now where they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we take some steam out of a, a big number like that this month in terms of the jobs report? I'm sure Wall Street is freaking out right now, <laughs> thinking about where interest rates might go. But at the same time, like I'm even hearing anecdotally about, you know, layoffs in finance, right? And tech, you know, have continued. So, so there is a lot of uneven out there. Aaron, what do you think? What are you seeing um, from your perspective? Is this good for workers, bad for workers, mixed bag? What's your take? I think the job growth number is a bit of an anomaly in the report. It's a really strong, uh, hot number. But if you look at all the other numbers in the report, uh, it doesn't, they, they don't tell the same story. So, mm -hmm. you know, wage growth, as you all have been saying, is, continues to decelerate. And that's, I think, kind of the best number for judging heat, because, you know, uh, if, if labor supply is coming online, you know, you can have job growth without adding pressure. And the way that you see that pressure show up is wage growth. And wage growth is over the whole economy. Um, you know, so anyway, uh, the other thing is that hours didn't change. Average hours worked. That's another sort of single signal of stability. Um, you know, all the labor force participation numbers, uh, employment population rate, unemployment rates, like didn't really change. The only change I could see really that seems at all important was the prime age um, employment rate, which is kind of a signal of core labor market strength. And that actually ticked down um, to 80.8, .8, ticked down 0.1 percentage point uh, from, a, from a, a hot, a very high. So I think, you know, we, we've been in a red hot labor market. The Fed put uh, raised rates and more supplies come online and things have like moderated to just very strong, uh, but not, it, it seems like sustainably strong. It still seems like it's sort of coasting towards a, um, it's, it's decelerating and um, hopefully it won't stall. Yeah, you're, I think it was really right to point out that there, there are a lot of sort of mixed numbers in this report in and of itself, right? We have this really big um, job growth number. And yet a lot of other things are just holding steady, right? So the unemployment rates holding steady, labor force participation's holding steady, wages are, you know, creeping up, but not really uh, knocking it out of the park. Um, and, you know, yet we're seeing that big job number along with what we saw in the JOLTS report, right? With a, a big jump in job openings. So it, it's kind of curious to be thinking like, how do we square all those numbers? And you kind of wonder if we're a little bit in a a cross current here where things are changing, or at least some employers are in a holding pattern, like wondering like what's going to happen next, some of that unevenness, right, that Harry was talking about. Others are forging ahead where, you know, we know that there's still a lot of uh, revenge travel out there. There's still a lot of let's get out and go to a concert. There's the, the swifty economics um, going on that's, uh, you know, are people just getting out uh, and doing more things? So you see that leisure and hospitality, you know, growth. You see that growth in in healthcare in those places, but not not everywhere across the entire economy. And then again, you know, with the wages, you know, even with that um, that increase, you pointed out, and Harry did too, that's a deceleration. And yet, we're not seeing that on the inflation side, right? So inflation has come down, but in the last few months, it's actually ticked back up just a little bit, right? So the CPI rose to 3.7% on an annualized rate um, in August, uh, at least the latest report that we have. We don't have the, the newest one for September yet. And that was a little bit of an acceleration from the 3.3% we had seen in July. So it's a little, I think you have a good point there about, you know, if it's really a red hot labor market, we'd be seeing wages, much stronger wage growth, right? That That's probably the canary in the coal mine in terms of is this a good thing for workers is what's happening to wages. Okay, 
let's go beyond the headlines. So the reason why we invite uh, you two terrific uh, labor economists with us on this broadcast is because you know a lot about the labor market and you always look deeper into this report because we're all labor nerds here. Um, and we all focus on different numbers. So I would love to hear kind of, you know, what's your stat of the day or what's the thing you're looking at that tells us a little bit underneath how the economy is affecting maybe particular populations um, or, you know, even kind of a, an insight or even a thing you're just looking for uh, over the coming months. So, Harry, I'm going to jump back to you. What's, what's your stat of the day? Um, so, so I, I, again, I think the contrast between the big payroll jumps uh, and the moderate wage increases is the single biggest thing going on. Uh, and, and then that, um, that really stunning unevenness across the sectors, which really suggests most sectors are not really hot. When you compare this with other numbers, and, and Alicia, I'm going to differ slightly with you, because when you look at you know, the, the uptick in inflation is mostly just driven by gasoline prices. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the PCE inflation rate, the core PCE inflation rate, which is really the one the Fed pays the most attention to, that has remained very moderate. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has averaged 0.2% a month over the last four or five months, suggesting inflation only in the ballpark of 2.5%. So if that's the most important inflation number, it kind of suggests that both the wages and the inflation numbers are moderating. I like to put these numbers uh, in context also with looking at productivity growth uh, to see if, because not all wage growth is inflationary. Uh, and of course, we had a very mm. big bump up in productivity uh, in, in the last quarter. We don't know what the current quarter is, but the productivity growth numbers are averaging one, one and a half percent, which means we could afford wage growth ahead of inflation. Uh, and and if, if inflation is really, you know, let, let's say, somewhere in that two and a half to three percent, we, we could be uh, affording more wage growth without it being inflationary. And I, and I think that's where we are right now. So when you look at all those numbers, uh, I think it does contrast a lot with the hotness suggested by this payroll growth, again, mostly driven by three sectors. Uh, and, and, and like Aaron, I think if you only focus on the payroll growth, you're going to get a misleading picture. Just putting those other numbers in perspective, it does suggest that moderation is still going on and, and wage growth does not seem to be inflationary at this point. Yeah, I think that decoupling of wage growth from, you know, um, the overall level of inflation in the economy has been an important lesson coming out of COVID that those two things do not have to be um, moving together for exactly the reasons you were talking about in terms of productivity, also in terms of the margins, right, that employers have coming out of COVID where they, you know, had record profits, maybe lots of cash they were sitting on, they could afford to pay higher wages. I think also, you know, you're totally right that most of that increase, you know, has been gas prices, but it worries me a little bit that the shelter index has also been rising um, pretty much like throughout this. And again, but it's uneven, right? So in places like Massachusetts, we're in a a housing crisis, although we're almost always in a housing crisis here, but in other places of the country, not so much. So I, I think it's it's really hard to um, make these like sort of big general statements with these kinds of reports where we know there's a lot of unevenness underneath it. Um, Aaron, what's your stat of the day? Yeah, I, I just want to double down on this um, prime age EPOP number, uh, employment rate number for Americans between 25 and 54. Um, that, you know, this has been climbing up and it's been an important signal of, of core labor market strength because it kind of omits people who are on the margins of work who are maybe still in school or, you know, close to thinking about retiring or, you know, uh, in the sort of core working years and suggests that, um, the fact that it's ticking down or it hasn't risen in the last couple months um, is pretty strong evidence of a moderation of the, you know, it's not like the labor market is um, out of, um, you know, we, we've, I guess the concern is that maybe we've hit a ceiling here and uh, that, you know, there's not a lot of core supply left to tap into but um you know we have seen big declines in employment rates for senior citizens like basically people over 65 and sort of close to 65 has come down a lot 
um, since the pandemic. And, you know, I think if there's going to be growth in labor supply um, or employment rates, it's going to come there probably. So, um, yeah, I'm, I think uh, there is this uh, signal of, um, yeah, maybe there's not a ton, ton more growth to be had here. Uh, in the in the middle of the labor market, and maybe we should be focusing more on um, you know helping attach people who ha have been out. Yeah, well, that's actually where I'm going with my stat of the day, or maybe non-stat of the day, depending on how you look at it. You know, I really like to look at numbers that give us a little deeper understanding of the relationship between employer demand for particular workers and worker groups and where that's going. Um, so for me, I'm really keeping an eye on that women's labor force participation rate because uh, during COVID, you know, really plummeted sharply. Um, we saw coming out of COVID, it dipped every time we hit a new wave of COVID, every time we hit a new school year, which is, you know, now actually been documented as a, as a seasonal effect. Um, but, you know, one thing I'm worried about is as we turn off those child care stabilization subsidies from the American Rescue Plan Act, um, that have been propping up the childcare industry, what does that mean uh, for women's labor force participation? So in this jobs report, we saw that the labor force participation rate ticked down uh, slightly for women, um, you know, from 59 to 58.9, so that 0.1%, but it ticked up for men, right? So again, we're seeing that divergence between men and women that we see every September as we get back to school. Um, so I'm not as worried about this month, but what I am worried about is future months. And I really do think that by the end of the year, we will probably see some of the effects of that pullback in terms of the subsidization of childcare affecting labor force participation for women, because we've certainly seen the opposite where when we were subsidizing it, right? So ARPA provided, you know, $24 billion in stabilization to childcare centers that helped over 200,000 providers stay in business we actually have gotten to record levels of women participating in the labor market, you know, 25 to 54 year olds hitting 78% labor force participation and women with children under the age of five hitting uh, 70%, which is um, like an all time high. So it's, uh, it just sort of stands to reason that it's hard to see how that's gonna be maintained when we pull those uh, subsidies back. And so there's some estimates, you know, um, by the Century Foundation saying, we could see 70,000 facilities going out of business. We could see 3.2 million children without uh, childcare, and that largely uh, falls on moms to fill the gap. So whether it quite comes to that kind of childcare Armageddon, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think we're going to see it in the numbers. And I don't usually go on record saying <laughs> we're going to see something, but I feel pretty confident in that one. Okay, uh, final question. So, you know, we like to think about not just what happened this month, but in the longer term, right? What do we think this means for worker power? So, Aaron, I'm going to start off with you um, this time. Have workers been gaining or losing power over this last uh, year or so in 2023? Where, where do we think we're at in terms of, um, you know, the arc uh, that swings between employers and workers? I think the you know, we came into the year at a very high level of worker power in the labor market. Um, you know, 2022, I think, was really a peak. And once the Fed started raising rates and tampening down labor demand, that sort of started eroding some worker bargaining power. And it's, you know, we've seen that continue. I guess the only thing I would say is that we also see workers taking action to join together and you know, try to form unions, unionize workers trying to go on um, taking strong positions and bargaining with employers, striking sometimes, or just you know achieving strong contracts like the Teamsters with UPS. And so that's some countervailing force there. Uh, and you know, I think we have more workers on strike right now than we've had uh, in a long time. So, I, I think the macro forces are sort of trending down, but there are groups of workers who are trying to build power together. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Harry, you get the final word before I answer. Have workers been gaining or losing power over the last you know, six to 12 months? And where do you see things heading for the rest of 2023? 
I, I, I would sort of agree with Aaron. Um, the unionized workers clearly have enough power to get themselves better to strike and get themselves better wage packages, but always remembering that unions are only represent 6% of the private labor force. So, so most workers aren't in that situation. Um, and, and I do think workers do still have some muscle left, but you know, when you look at these wage numbers, it does suggest that they are not as confident uh, of their bargaining power, certainly compared to a year ago when the wage increases were, uh, were very strong. Uh, keep in mind that before a lot of workers had piled up savings from all the government bailout money from not spending much during the downturn. Most of those are gone, mm -hmm. uh, at least for the for the median worker and below that. So, you know, the, so, so workers can still get some leverage out of what remains a reasonably tight rate labor market. But again, no, knowing that the Fed could continue to tamp down that demand with higher interest rates, uh, I think their their leverage is limited and, and you see that in their behavior that they are not nearly as confident as they were a year ago uh in, in demanding high wages most of the great resignation is gone quit rates have more or less come down near where they were before so so it, it remains kind of a mixed picture but but definitely for most of the labor force uh decelerating uh and and moving down and and, and we still hope there's enough left for some real wage growth for these folks even after inflation yeah, I think you both raise a really important point. And I guess, you know, sort of my final take on this is that, um, you know, workers have managed to reclaim some of the power that they had lost over the last one or two decades, even uh, where we've been in these um, kind of jobless recoveries, very slow recoveries. That was very different coming out of COVID where, you know, once we reopened everything, workers gained the upper hand. They were in demand. They were needed. We saw, you know, teenagers getting employed. We saw uh, women coming back into the labor market. We saw lots of groups. We saw at one point really, um, you know, black workers making gains on white workers. That's really stalled out. Um, even, you know, closing those racial gaps has stalled out. So I think we're at that moment where the market forces have done as much as they can for work at, worker power, and we need to turn to the institutions. And that's where, you know, you were both mentioning unions. Uh, you're absolutely right, Harry. It only affects 6% of the labor market, and yet um, some of the agreements that they do strike can have ripple effects, right, across the economy. So you think about what the Writers Guild of America uh, managed to get um, uh, from the motion picture and television producers, not just about wages, but also about how AI is going to be used, right? How um, uh, how they're going to be able to uh, negotiate um, all sorts of uh, royalties and things like that. So. So sometimes, right, these, these agreements go further. You think about a little bit of what the UAW is doing right now, right? So Sean Fain's going to say something later today about whether um, the intensified bargaining with the Detroit three automakers has produced enough progress to forestall more walk walkouts, right? And he's got a kind of like uh, production facility by production facility, like when are we going to walk out if we need to? Um, and so that's definitely uh, been helping to uh, push those um those wages higher, they're, they're getting potentially raises in excess of 20% over the life of a contract. Um, and with cost of living adjustment, they could see close to 30% increases in pay. Those, those are pretty big, could have ripple effects. And then the last you know, union action we've been seeing with Kaiser Permanente, I mean, this is the largest healthcare strike in US history. Um, it's only in its second day, it's gonna end uh, this weekend um, because workers uh, agreed only to strike for three days because um, it's a little different when you're a healthcare worker and it's striking compared to maybe an auto worker. But, uh, you know, Kaiser's already agreed to across the board wage increases. Um, and now, you know, healthcare workers are really negotiating for some of those other things in terms of staffing, you know, outsourcing, um, you know, and other things to reduce turnover uh, coming out of the pandemic. So I think, you know, when we think about labor market institutions, we have to also forget there's other things like the minimum wage. Um, there are a number of different institutions that maybe should be brought to bear to stabilize the gains uh, that workers have made. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, I wanna thank today's guests, Harry and Aaron for their expert insights and their continued excellent work. Um, I also wanna thank Asia Sims, our producer, and before you go, Seth Harris would be very cross with me if I didn't remind you to subscribe to the Power at Work blog so we can keep you updated on all the great content that we're producing. And thanks for watching. We will see you back again on the blog again soon.